So this is what we'll cover today. In the I think in the last ten minutes, we'll probably take questions. Uh, first 35, 30, 35 minutes. You know, this is what we'll have to cover today. We'll start with a quick definition of what is DAS. You know, I think from the conversation between Romel and Niti, I understand. I think people will be familiar with it, but I thought you know to define, set the context, it will be good to actually define what is the uh, definition I am looking at, and you know, base the whole presentation on that. Then we will uh, quickly cover uh, the evolution towards BAS. Uh, basically, you know how we have come up to the point till where we have got today. Then we'll quickly survey the landscape. Uh, of course, it is no means an exhaustive uh, survey of the landscape, but I've tried to cover uh, you know the majority of the models that I've uh, seen being prevalent uh, in this uh, uh, you know the current landscape, right? And also give examples of. Uh, the various companies across the globe for you know each of these models. We look at how these people monetize, and we'll probably look at pros and cons of uh, you know each of these models for the various stakeholders. And finally, we'll again you know some bit of crystal ball uh, case. We'll try to predict what is going to happen, looking at you know what has happened so far. Okay. Uh, before I start, I just wanted to draw out uh, on a couple of key exclusions. Uh, you know, I will again. You know, I've consciously kept out payment services and providers from uh, you know what I'll be talking about. Uh, though it is an integral part of BAS, I felt that you know if I start talking about them, you know it might probably you know need a much longer time. So I've decided to focus on you know players who are looking at the core banking capabilities like an account opening or a, a lending or deposits and things like that. So payment will be incidental there, but they'll not be the primary focus there. And uh, the regulations landscape is actually a very you know interesting and emerging landscape, especially around the digital banks and the neo banks. That also I'm not looking at. Basically, you know, as uh, uh, you know, the market is evolving, regulators are also evolving, coming up with new kinds of licenses and all those things. That would have been a very interesting topic, but again, you know, because of the lack of time, and I'm just focusing on uh, the core uh, banking of them. So moving on. Uh, so in fact, uh, I think Bill Gates, towards the late 90s, had made a statement that you know banking is necessary and banks are not. And with banking as a service, I think we are actually realizing you know what he actually meant by it, and we are probably closer to that than than we were in 1997. Okay. So what is BAS, right? What we mean that BAS is the provision of banking products and services through third-party systems including non-banking businesses, right? So basically, I think this is the key part, two third-party systems. Uh, and these third-party systems could be fintechs or it could be some non-banking businesses also. We'll see some of the examples as uh, we go along. Uh, this is a pictorial representation where you have a business, which is the third-party provider I'm talking about at the center. Uh, they have the, they're offering multiple services to their customers, as you see it here. And then, then as a part of that, you know, buffet of services they offer, if there is a banking capability required, they actually, you know, hit the BAS system, right? And BAS system, I've explicitly put it as, you know, two different things. One, you have a BAS layer, and then second, you have a banking system, which is actually going to do the, you know, actual account opening or the uh, service fulfillment and things like that, right? So in some examples, you will see that these are together. And in some examples, you will see that there is just one layer, a uh, bass layer that this vendor is providing, and then he's integrating with the various players, various banking system to actually realize the functionality, right? That's why I've called it out. In the examples, as we go along, we'll, uh, you know, see uh, what fits well, right? But essentially, the bass system, you will have uh, one layer, which is kind of, uh, uh, a, you know, outward facing, where it gets a request and things like that, and then there is, the another part which is actually going to do the transactions. Moving on, uh, so we will see how we have reached where we are today. So it's a brief, uh, a, a, you know, history of uh, banking. So initially, you know, before the 1960s, before the advent of ATM, I would say, you know, essentially all the banking used to happen. I, I shouldn't use the word all. Most of the banking used to happen at the branches, right? You know, if I had to deposit the money, I had to go to the uh, branch, if I had to take it out, I had to go to the branch. Of course, there were some check transactions as well, but you know, 
most of the transactions were happening uh, from within the bank's uh, physical boundaries, right? Then in 1967, the first ATM was launched in UK. And then with the arrival of that, actually transactions went out of uh, uh, the bank's physical boundaries, though you could argue that ATM, a lot of ATMs were within uh, uh, the bank's boundary. But, you know, ATM was the first scenario where a banking transaction was being initiated by someone other than the bank employee, right? But though that was happening within this uh, bank's device. Then uh, from that, it moved to the internet banking where banking transactions could actually be initiated from a customer's device, right? A customer can look at it and, uh, you know, from, from his desktop or laptop, he could initiate a transaction, right? But that was still within the bank software. And then where we are today, you know, is the banking of service where it is completely, you know, the transaction initiation is also happening outside the bank software, you know, an API is calling a transaction and then, you know, bank software is setting the transaction. and all those things. So this is the journey we have had where, you know, transactions has been increasingly moving out from a bank's, uh, uh, you know, physical boundaries uh, from moving out of the network boundaries and finally you know it is even out of the banks uh, software systems that it is being uh, triggered right and where we are today is that uh, you know increasingly in fact i, I remember seeing some statistics wherein uh, into 2018 almost 85 90 percent of transactions were happening outside of uh, the bank software you know internet banking or mobile banking and then you know banking of service in the next five to seven years was actually supposed to take that much of a share right uh, we will talk about it i have some numbers which i'll share towards the end of it so this is how we have got here uh, wherein you know we have reached a point uh, of banking of a service uh, with the evolution of course you know this journey involved a lot of evolution uh, right in terms of uh, uh, the openness of the systems, the security of the systems, the speed of uh, internet, uh, the security of consumers accessing it, authentication of customers, and all those things. So it's basically you know aided by multiple technologies uh, it, that have uh, that evolved over a period of, time. and that is what again I'll be kind of detailing it uh, in my next slide on what are the enablers for banking of a service. So any trend or any offering, if you kind of look at it. You know, generally people look at it from three different perspectives, right? Desirability, feasibility, and viability. And only then, then there is an overlap of all these three. Uh, do we have a successful offer? So I've tried to uh, look at the enablers at uh, from a similar dimension. Starting with desirability, uh, I think customers today are demanding you know better experiences, and that is a continuous process. It's not that you know people say that okay, you know I want a better experience, and then uh, once you deliver it, they're happy. You know, they're looking at the next thing. Uh, you know, I, I, I was working with uh, European banks in one of my earlier jobs. And then, you know, they said, you know, how can I deliver an Amazon-like experience to my customers, right? Though, it is the, though the example was from a retail domain, but banks were actually looking at how do we actually deliver the kind of experience customers are used to. So that has been one strong driver uh, uh, from from a BAS perspective, because the traditional banking services have struggled to provide that kind of uh, an experience. So multiple reasons, I'll not get into those. The second part is uh, regulation, which is more from a banking service provider perspective, right? Uh, around the globe, if you see, I think it started with uh, EU, but around the globe, there are regulations uh, around opening uh, up banking for third parties, right? Uh, I think fundamental realization is that a data of a customer belongs to the customer and not to the bank, right? And around that, there are a lot of uh, uh, you know new regulations, PSD2, open banking, and things like that, which are forcing banks to open up, right? And again, you know, with banks being forced to open up, they are looking at okay, now that we have spent so much time to open it up, how else do we monetize it? Again, that is where you know BAS uh, becomes a good option there. The next dimension is feasibility, uh, wherein you know the technologically whether is it possible and things like that. This APIification, I think, last four five years or even probably more than that, you know, banks have been spending a lot on this APIification, creating microservices, modular things and things like that, right? So that is actually helping. So you know, once you have an API, you can open it up, and again, it's probably that APIification is also aided by a move towards uh, BAS, but 
you know, the APIification has made BAS also possible, right? Uh, uh, fintechs can actually ally with whoever they want and then go and do it. Second part is the improved connectivity. Uh, by connectivity, I mean, you know, even the network availability and things like that. A lot of uh, uh, things moving to cloud, uh, improved network connectivity across the globe and things like that has made this more feasible. Yeah, otherwise, you know, there's no point in having a, a service where a customer has to wait for uh, you know 20 30 seconds to get a response or you know the, the transaction is successful only 50 percent of the time and things like that. then comes the third part which is the viability part right why are businesses uh, willing to offer this right that is where i would like to talk about focus on the whole offer what i mean by the whole offer is that uh, see businesses were looking at a a customer's use case and then solving one part of it. Right? Now businesses are increasingly talking about solving the entire use case for the customer. Right? To give you an example, I, I used to work with uh, Magic Tricks earlier. They were primarily focused on property listing. Right? But if you look at their journey in the last two, three years, they realized that you know property listing is just one part of the address change use case. And there are a bunch of activities around it, you know, like uh, uh, getting the rental agreement, getting hackers and movers, getting the house clean and things like that, that are required as a part of it. So now they, they have, they call themselves a full stack provider where they, they focus on the whole offer and try to solve all the entire customer use case. Right? So that is one thing. I have an example, I have multiple examples of that. We will, we will discuss about that in later slides. Then we have these COVID related restrictions, which have obviously, you know, push these customers into adopting these digital means much faster, right? Uh, I used to be a part of Cynical when uh, this whole uh, uh, pandemic and the lockdown started. And our experience in the first three to six months was that it just accelerated the digital transformation. A lot of banks were saying that what we were expecting to happen over three to five years is happening in you know, three to six months, right? So that also has, uh, 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 you know, push these a lot of the businesses to offer these services and make those services viable. I just want to bring up one more perspective of this, and I'll use uh, this construct for uh, uh, the rest of my presentation when I'm talking about various models. Uh, if you look at a customer's journey, uh, especially a banking service journey, uh, you know, maybe in the 80s and 90s, the entire customer's journey was being owned by the bank, right? Uh, customer awareness, how does the customer come to know about a product, customer acquisition, how does he apply, how does he kind of, uh, how does the bank do KYC for the customer, then how is the account set up, what is the configuration, what are the interest rates and things like that, uh, then how do how does he initiate a service and then how the service is fulfilled and what are, how does upsell happen, uh, retention happens. So if you look at it, the entire chain was actually owned by bank, right? Uh, again, I don't know the uh, kind of the age group that people belong to, but e even in, uh, in the eighties, if you had to open a bank account, you needed an introduction letter from someone. You had to take it to the branch, give it, give a letter, and then you know they'll take some time to do the account setup. Then uh, again, you know you have to visit the branch each and every time and things like that. So that is how it used to be. But with banking of service coming in, right? Like multiple uh, parties can own each of the steps uh, in this customer journey, right? And if you and apart from an account setup and service fulfillment, we don't need a bank uh, to do that particular activity, right? Account setup and service fulfillment are basically, I think, you know, they they are regulated aspects. Service fulfillment also means that when deposit comes, the money has to be held and things like that. So that is where you need a you need a lot of regulations around, and you need a licensed party to do that. So apart from that, all these other activities actually, uh, you know, can be done by uh, any other part, right? So when I'm looking at various models, I look at it from this construct and hopefully, you know, I'll be able to kind of convey uh, the essence of what Bill Gates was saying when he said, you know, banking is required by banks. So we'll use that construct and uh, look at multiple models. The first model I want to start off with is the aggregator model. The screenshot, screenshot I have is from Bank Bazaar. I don't know whether that is very clear there. Uh, so if you look at this space here, right? 
the dark blue one is what is being provided by the party I'm talking about, right? Uh, the aggregators. Then the light blue ones are ones where an aggregator can play a part also, and the bank will also play some part of it. And rest of the ones are ones where uh, you know banks actually own uh, those parts of the customer journey. So if you look at an aggregator, uh, a, a bank bazaar, for example, if I want to open a deposit, I say which are the deposits that are uh, good for me. There'll be an entire list. You know that, that uh, it'll say okay. Uh, it, you know I see say bank is providing this deposit. So that is where the customer awareness uh, is owned by bank bazaar. And then if you say apply. Again, this varies based on uh, one uh, vendor to another vendor, wherein some vendors throw their own application form, you fill that, and then bank does the KYC, and then it gets into the account setup and things like that. But there are some vendors, if you click on it, it actually takes you to an ICICI site where you fill that information, and then you know the customer acquisition is also owned by them. And rest of it is uh, actually owned by the bank itself. So if I, if kind of taking my example of ICICI forward, the account setup will be done there. Uh, you know, if it's a deposit, they will uh, probably get in touch with you to kind of move the money, uh, create a deposit, define all the terms and things like that. Uh, and then cross sell, upsell, I've seen both models. Uh, there are models where aggregators actually kind of do a cross sell and upsell. Uh, for I think a, a very good example would be home loan. If I'm applying, if they might actually come back and say, you know, why, why don't you take a home insurance also and things like that. But of course, ICICI, because it owns my relationship, they'll also try to upsell. And then retention will be purely with ICICI because aggregators are, again, you know, more focused on uh, probably getting more customers rather than servicing. They have given some examples, uh, the leading examples I have seen across the globe. But if you look at any market, you'll find multiple players like, right, you know, Bank Bazaar, Policy Bazaar, even in Indian market, there'll be multiple players. Uh, UK market, money supermarket actually is, is, is a very interesting option, right? Uh, they are looking primarily at financial services products earlier, but now they are actually offering uh, things like comparing your uh, cable plans, comparing your phone plans, and things like that. They're actually looking at the entire customer wallet and then uh, you know providing the comparison. Bankrate.com is again a, a leading player in the US. How do these people monetize, right? Aggregators primarily their source of monetization is commissions. And there also I've seen two models. One is lead based, wherein they just say that, okay, I've sent you so many people, sent so many people into your site, pay me so much. That is one model. Increasingly, people are moving towards an outcome model where uh, if it is a deposit, they take a cut out of uh, the deposit amount. If it's a home loan, it is, okay, you know, a commission based on uh, the amount dispersed. Okay. And then, of course, they do a lot of ads because they have so much of traffic, they're able to charge uh, uh, customers for the ads and then they push a lot of ads. The other interesting thing I've seen uh, is the humans as a service. Uh, you know, Policy Bazaar way back in 2013, 2014 itself, what they were doing is that because they get so many leads, uh, they will kind of tie up with various insurance providers and say that, you know, I can ask you know, my employees to make a call on behalf of your insurance and uh, uh, go ahead and sell that product, right? So that, that again, you know, because of uh, uh, the volume of traffic they have and because of the call center network they have, they also provide this kind of a service. And again, I'm just talking about a call center perspective, but if it's, if it's a ops, uh, a backend work also, similar uh, possibilities. Are. And what are the pros and cons? Uh, from an aggregated uh, perspective, it helps them build a broad audience for process. From a bank's perspective, it actually improves their reach significantly. Uh, and then from a customer's perspective, it actually gives them multiple uh, uh, shops. The cons of this approach is that uh, the aggregators lack integration with the customer journey. And the example of Magic Bricks I was talking about, for Magic Bricks, you know, when somebody is actually searching for their home, they can actually combine it and then say, you know, why don't you look at home loan offering also from our side? And they can embed the embed it within the customer use case. But for aggregators, they uh, a customer has to come to their site and then say explicitly that I'm looking for a home loan for them to identify the intent. So that way, this is a, a challenge that they're trying to address. Then from a bank's perspective, it is loss of pricing power, obviously, because it makes uh, uh, the market a lot more competitive. And from a consumer perspective, uh, 
the downside is I'm sharing data with a data hungry company, right? Anyone who is, I'm sure most, a lot of you would have uh, put a request with a bank bazaar or policy bazaar some, uh, at any point of time. And you would know the kind of uh, trouble you would have got into, right? You know, multiple calls. And in fact, at one point of time, they used to be very aggressive also. If you tell them that, you know, I just I was just trying, uh, looking, you know, just trying out something, they, they'll get aggressive with you as well. So that is there. And again, you know, that is only one part of it. Uh, we don't know how what, what all they use our data for and where all it's getting leaked. So this is one model. Uh, next one is the whole offer providers uh, I was uh, talking about earlier, where uh, the actual providers, business is something else, but they want to embed banking as a part of the user chain, right? Uh, the example I've given here is of uh, Amazon. Basically, the screenshot is from CP Insights, where this is looking at a Chase Bank's homepage for retail and business and showing what all products Amazon is actually providing for the customers in the similar space, right? For credit cards, they're providing multiple products, uh, Amazon and Pay, Protect, Amazon Cash. And in, in fact, this doesn't include the uh, buy now, pay later kind of scheme that Amazon is providing in the Indian market as well. Similarly, as a part of uh, uh, the business offering, it is providing a lot of uh, you know credit and line, loans and line of credit and payment acceptance services to their customers. See, all these are traditional banking capabilities but are embedded within uh, the Amazon experience. So this buy now, pay later, I was talking about, basically the way it would work is that at, at time of checkout, as a part of payment options, it will say buy now, pay later, right? Or in fact, I think Amazon was also trying out the option where uh, they will say, hey, you can get a credit line of uh, 10,000 and you can use that to purchase anything you want. And then as and when you purchase, you will be start, they'll start, uh, uh, you know, charging interest and things like that. Right. So here again, the focus is on the customer use case. Primarily, it will be a non-financial use case, and then uh, you know banking will be embedded there. Right. So here again, you know customer awareness. So if you look at this, the third-party provider is owning a lot more of this uh, uh, customer journey than uh, the banking service provider. Right. So this is where so this is the transition we are seeing, wherein. From the bank owning the entire piece now you know various pieces are being owned by uh, other other vendors i'll not get into this because of lack of time but i'll quickly run through uh, this section in terms of what are all the key players we see here of course amazon uh, is something i spoke about uber us they do something similar they issue debit cards they actually issue line of credits they let custom uh, they let their drivers actually withdraw one or two days before uh, uh, they would have normally otherwise withdrawn and things like that. Shopify is an e-commerce, uh, you know, website building platform. Again, you know, once the money comes in, they kind of uh, have embedded banking uh, capabilities to invest the money and things like that. Klarna is a, a BNPL player, uh, focus more on Europe, uh, not called out a separate country there. And Acons actually is an interesting uh, example as well. You know, it is, Primarily an investment provider, but what they've done is they've tied up with a bank to provide uh, a debit card where you can set that, you know, for every debit transaction that is happening through that card, save a certain amount into my account, right? So basically they're trying to see how they can do their investment uh, uh, into, build their investment into the savings journey. I'm just looking at one question. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to it. I'll come back to the question and answer that later. Uh, then, uh, so basically, how do they monetize? Basically, it is they again because this is more of a sub complementary uh, supplementary offering for their uh, overall value. The primary uh, aim is to monetize the customer better through greater value. And then, of course, there are service charges they actually charge for the customers or you know maybe some in case of uh, accounts in this case where there's a debit card involved they'll probably be earning interchange right and what are the uh, pros and cons of it for customers it is uh, for, for the providers it is basically improved customer satisfaction for the banks it is lower customer acquisition cost uh, and then for again from a customer point of view it is you know they're getting everything in a single place but for the bank they become invisible to customers. Even uh, you know, in a lot of these scenarios, you may 
you know the name of the bank might be mentioned only in some sign print somewhere you know they may not be even uh, knowing it i think for example amazon bnpl was being provided by a vendor called capital flow but you know that was invisible for most part and again the other part from a consumer consumer perspective is that uh, you know especially when it comes to these payment mechanisms and uh, bnpl right a lack of discipline actually could lead to very bad outcomes i think even today's morning uh, newspaper there was an article about uh, 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 somebody ending their lives because they were not able to repay a loan which was given easily to them and things like that, right so that is something uh, you know yeah while it is good to have this option if people don't have that discipline it could actually have a, a very bad outcomes moving on uh, the next example i want to talk about is uh, uh, the neo bank like a new bank i've seen two models i think we just have 10 more minutes so i'll probably rush through these slides just uh, highlighting on key things new what new bank i've seen two models one is when it ties up with multiple banks uh another is when uh, you know they tie up with a single bank so first i'll start with the multiple bank thing uh the example is open <clears throat> i don't know whether you've seen open so open if you go you can actually open a business account add your existing bank accounts also there or even while opening a bank account you can say that i want to open an account with an icsa bank or an s bank or a kotak bank and things like that and then uh, on top of that they actually provide a lot of controls they provide expense management and things like that, right so that is why if you look at the service chain i i feel you know they have a uh, role to play in each of the steps in the customer journey uh, though you know they will need a bank for the service fulfillment and account setup but they also uh, uh, provide a, a key piece there so for example that this open bank you will have a lot of uh, limits on expense management and things like that right there the limit will be set on the open bank uh, side and they will be the one who is actually uh, so the account setup part that limit will be set on the open bank side the actual account creation and whatever is needs to be done on the bank side that will happen on the bank side similarly when a transaction is hitting them initially they will validate all the limits and things like that and then they will actually uh, pass it on to the bank for the service so that's where i've put that you know they have a role to play in each of these uh, steps uh, and then see only uh, the, the main thing here is that uh, they, you know you will know the bank you're interacting with so the bank is not completely invisible okay. uh, this is a model i'm seeing primarily in india uh, in europe i don't see much of this model though there's a lot of uh, effort towards account application but i'm not looking at this model per se there uh, in these guys make their uh, uh, income from interchange fees they get commissions uh, whenever an account is opening and they also provide some value added services uh, again, there are multiple pros and cons uh, for each of these parties, but one con I, I would want to highlight is here is uh, for uh, the new bank, they have to maintain relationship with multiple uh, partners. Uh, anybody who has done uh, uh, you know, partner management will know the pain there. And then from a bank's perspective also, uh, you know, how do they transfer that relationship uh, to an ICICI from an open bank, right? Because the customer access is through the open bank side, will they be able to actually transfer that relationship? Right? So that is the challenge they face. Moving on, uh, the next is how I want to talk about is tie up with a single bank. Uh, so again, uh, Tide is the example I've spoken about. Uh, Tide is primarily a UK bank. They've come to India. India, the model is not yet very clear. Uh, then you see Ryzen in the UK, Aspire in Singapore, Warren, you know, the bank focuses on the customer requirements, building products for them and things like that. The actual banking part is being taken care of by one of those banks. Uh, see, typically in these sites, you will see such a big disclaimer towards the bottom, wherein it will say that our relationship is with this bank and all the money actually goes to it. So that I'm sure people will have a lot of apprehensions. And, uh, you know, this they would have provided this to actually uh, kill those apprehensions. And how do they make money? Uh, most of these have subscription fees. You see uh, the screenshot there. Uh, it is like any SaaS service where you have multiple uh, plans uh, uh, to choose from and they ultimately choose one and proceed. 
right? And from a customer perspective, uh, typically these uh, accounts provide much better banking experience because the way these guys have developed themselves, right? Uh, they've actually started off looking at a customer's problem and then gone about how to solve it, how do we deliver value? And things like that. I think the typical uh, ThoughtWorks principle, we talk about delivering customer value and things like that. They have actually started off in uh, the last 10 years, they've focused on that and they've, they've been able to build a, a much better experience uh, for the customers. In fact, some of these new banks have also moved into a full-fledged bank, uh, right? Uh, Monzo, for example, started off as a new bank. They had tie, tie up with some bank. Now they have a banking license or, and they're actually providing the full stack service. In India, I think uh, Navi was, I think, conceptualized as a, a new bank, but they soon bought over a license of a cooperative bank and you know they are actually providing the full stack service. Also. The last model I want to touch upon uh, is the platform providers model. These are people, again, not completely related to what uh, the other example, but I, I thought this is a very key piece that I need to cover, wherein uh, these are guys who just provide the banking platform, right? They just provide a, 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 a core banking system, an accounting system, lending system, and things like that. And uh, anyone can tie up with them and uh, uh, build capabilities and deliver it to the customers, right? So if you look at uh, uh, Solaris Bank's first page, it says the tech company with a banking license, right? That is the advantage they provide. Uh, so in any market, banking is a highly regulated uh, space. And getting a banking license is, again, has varying difficulties, right? In some places it is easy, but some places it is really challenging. But that is seen as a real bottleneck. So that is where uh, some uh, some of these platform providers actually play a big role, wherein they have the licenses and uh, they're able to uh, uh, kind of open it up for others to use it. So if you look at the customer journey perspective, uh, there are no blues here, the light blues here, right? Everything is either a dark blue or a, a, a gray box here. Because you know it's very clear saying this is what we provide. You actually bring the rest of it and uh, build it on top of this. Okay. Uh, some of the examples are I think uh, Solaris and Clear are the leaders uh, in the space. They're pure play platform uh, players. Green Dot is a hybrid, I would say. Green Dot uh, operates as a bank as well. Uh, at the same time, they've also opened up their systems for uh, others to kind of uh, uh, build upon. In fact, uh, Uber ha has uh, a partnership with Green Dot for some of the products I refer to. BBVA is an interesting example. Uh, it is one of the biggest banks in the world, right? And they've recently uh, opened up their, uh, uh, you know, platform for uh, these uh, BAS offerings as well, right? So this is an example of a well-established banking player getting into the space, realizing the importance of this and, uh, you know, helping others uh, use that space. And Treasury Prime, again, is a, a slightly different example. Uh, whereas a uh, green dot, or a uh, uh, Solaris as a single core banking system that they're integrated to. Treasury Prime is actually acting as a matchmaker between uh, various banks and the fintechs, right? Which means they are integrated with uh, uh, multiple banks at the back end, uh, and a fintech can choose which banks they want to actually uh, route their transactions to. So, in some ways, this kind of pertains to the BAS layer I was referring to earlier. And they make money primarily by uh, uh, the subscription, and also they will have these transaction-based pricing, uh, right? The advantage here clearly is that, as I was saying earlier, uh, the banking service provider can focus on the customer problems and forget about operations. And even from uh, the bank's perspective, they can purely focus on optimizing the banking operations and not focus about, uh, you know, selling the product and things like that. So moving quickly to the future of BAS, uh, again, I think we spoke about, uh, you know, how it started with uh, the need to open it up. And today, uh, you know, we just saw uh, the, how new banks and embedded banking is there today. What I see as the future is that uh, one is these new banks actually are helping accelerate the innovation. I will, I'll talk about it in a bit. And uh, the other trend that I'm seeing is that they're building global propositions, right? Uh, no one is just talking about uh, doing it for a single country. So they start with it, they always talk about multiple countries. For example, Solaris, I think has tied up with uh, a vendor to provide these banking as a service across uh, uh, Europe, not just uh, 
in a particular country and then obviously you know uh, this i i also see this getting extended into uh, the those uh, space i just want to take a couple of minutes to elaborate on the accelerate innovation part the screenshot you are seeing is actually a survey uh, that was conducted uh, by cornerstone for the various google plex uh, features that was announced right i just want to draw your attention to two three features here of course google plex has is not probably you know it's not going to be launched anymore but some of these use cases kind of give you an insight of where we are headed right first is a get gas button that will uh, find the nearest gas station automatically pay for that right so if you look at it from google's perspective obviously you know they are trying your uh, tying it to, to the google maps uh, and maybe yeah they know where you are currently they can probably kind of tie it up with your search they probably know where you are headed and then say this is where you can get your gas and then uh, of course making the payment is probably the easier part i would say it could even look at the cards you are looking at and suggest this card is better for this payment or maybe if you go to a uh, gas you can go to the next gas station and get so much of a discount because of your card and things like that right so that becomes a very powerful use case you know what is just a payment is actually becoming a much fuller use case and if you look at it from a customer perspective ultimately what he wants to do is get gas right so that is uh, uh, one of the features they spoke about again get food is a similar feature right it can actually look at your search history and then say this is what this is the kind of food you prefer and then say this is the uh, shortest uh, commute for you and automatically it will pay for the order and actually if you look at the last part one it is talking about personalized offers from merchants and your search history and of course with gmail you know google knows everything about me right so generating a personalized offer tying up with various banks to do that and uh, making sure these offers are getting used it becomes very easy for someone like a google right so i think this is the direction probably it will go towards what we have to remember is a customer never sets out to do a transaction next never sets out to do a payment person right he's actually trying to kind of fulfill a requirement uh, and then payment is actually incidental to it more and more you will see these innovative propositions driving towards that where uh, payment takes a back seat or a banking transaction takes a back seat and uh, the customer's actual uh, use case takes a front seat so yeah that is what i had uh, if you have any questions you can type it on uh, the q and a while i take the questions that i have banking has a very wide reach from the richest to poorest if bas is really the future then how do we aim at filling this gap gopal just to sorry to break your flow is it okay if we take the questions offline just uh, running a little behind time yeah, so no. then one just... of the panelists will reach out to you and we can get the answers and post it in the chat box i mean in the q and a session so yeah, not a problem not a problem thank you so much gopal thanks. i understand it thanks everyone bye